Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, it's a pleasure to be talking to you about the pathophysiology of diabetic bone disease. And particularly, I'm going to focus on the use of bone turnover markers to better understand this. And it is a pleasure to be part of Fidelio and the research grouping where we're all coming from many different backgrounds, but to study the same problem. Of why is it that there's an increased fracture risk in patients with diabetes? So this is the outline of my talk. Uh, I'll begin by talking about diabetes and fracture risk, because uh, it's critical that we understand this relationship. And then I'll talk about bone turnover markers and just give a few basic facts to introduce the topic. I'll talk about what is known about the changes in bone turnover markers in diabetes. And we do know that consistently bone turnover markers are decreased in both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. What are the consequences in relation to fracture risk, in relation to the result, uh, response to anti-resortive therapy? And I'll say a little bit too about atypical femur fracture. And then finally, I'll finish up by talking about the causes of low bone turnover in diabetes, considering both the hormones and other regulatory factors. So uh, we conducted a systematic review and meta-analysis uh, led by Tatiana Vilasa, and she uh, shows here uh, that for type 1 diabetes, the risk of having a hip fracture, uh, which is what this particular figure shows, uh, was 4.9 relative risk, whereas for type 2 diabetes, it was 1.3. So um, summing, summing up over here on the right, uh, these two risk ratios, and if we look at the risk factors that she and others have identified, having diabetes for a longer duration, having poorer control, an increased risk of falls, particularly from the use of insulin and hypoglycemia that results as a consequence, uh, having a low BMI and uh, being female, all these things interact with diabetes to increase the risk of hip fracture. And so this research was part of uh, Tatiana's uh, PhD, and so here she is celebrating that. Now, whenever we see an increase in the risk of fracture, we wonder whether there is, can be fully explained by bone mineral density. So here I'm showing a summary of studies of bone mineral density in type 1 and type 2 diabetes. And the bone density is expressed as Z-score, which is the number of standard deviations below the average for the same age for the spine and hip. And we can see that in type two diabetes, in type one diabetes, that the Z score is reduced. But it's only reduced by a tiny amount, about 0.2 to 0.4 of a standard deviation. In type two diabetes, surprisingly, the bonus is increased by about 0.4 to 0.3 standard deviation units. And so then when you then translate what we'd expect the fracture effects would be of these bone density changes, then for type 1 diabetes, the reduction of about 0.3 or so of a sudden deviation would, would cause a hip fracture risk of 1.4. But we observed that the, uh, the hip fracture risk was 4.9 4 fold increased. For the type 2 diabetes, we'd expect a reduction in fracture risk because the BMDs are higher than expected. But we uh, observed an increase in hip fracture risk in type 2 diabetes. So bone density is just not explaining all of the fracture risk. Now I'm not saying that bone density doesn't relate to fracture risk in diabetes. Uh, this study from Schwartz uh, clearly illustrates that the lower the femoral neck BMD, the higher the risk of hip fracture on the left and of non-spine fracture on the right. But what's happening in diabetes is that the, for a given level of fracture risk, the BMD is higher in diabetes, whether it's hip fracture or non-vertebral fracture. So when we're trying to understand the strength of the bone and the likelihood of it fracturing, uh, we don't just think about bone density, we also need to think about bone quality. And so in type 1 and type 2 diabetes, it's really quite likely there's a big alteration in bone quality. And so what do we mean by bone quality? Well, 
we can divide it into these four characteristics of microarchitecture, bone turnover, mineralization, uh, the degree of mineralization of the bone tissue, and the micro damage accumulation, and the development of micro cracks. And we can even subdivide the microarchitecture into bone cells and uh, the, 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 the calcium hydroxyapatite and the mineral, or the matrix, and particularly the major protein in bone, collagen. So, so these are the things we can be thinking about. And so I know that in Fidelio, uh, many people, many investigators are looking at some, as some of these aspects. And so today I'm going to be focusing on bone turnover. I, but first of all, bone turnover is actually related to these other facets like microarchitecture and mineralization and micro damage, as we'll see in a moment. Um, but, uh, but, people, but we have learned a lot by looking at bone quality. And uh, just a couple of examples. Uh, so there's been a lot of research into cortical porosity in diabetes. And we can measure cortical porosity in people <clears throat> by using high resolution quantitative computed tomography. And the porosity is increased, particularly if there's microvascular disease or neuropathy. So that's really interesting because many of the complications of diabetes are a consequence of microvascular disease. So if the bone complications are too, then that would be in keeping with the rest of these complications. On the right, uh, I mentioned bone toughness, which can be me measured by uh, micro indentation, which gives us bone material strength index, which is decreased in type two diabetes. And the decrease relates to the decrease in bone turnover as measured by a bone marker. And so people have already measured uh, some of the bone quality issues and had some positive findings that might help to explain why the bone quality is poorer in diabetes. So I'm going to then uh, review the evidence about bone to never markers, but before I do that, I just need to say uh, what on earth they are and, and how you need to study them to get good results. So the bone to never markers are essentially reflecting the activity of two of the types of cell within bone, the, the osteoclasts, which are responsible for bone resorption. And I'm listing here uh, the collagen degradation products. So type one collagen is the most important protein in bone. And uh, there are crosslinks formed between uh, the collagen molecules, which are important for the strength. And one of these molecules is called the oxyperidinine, which is fairly specific to bone. And when the ends of the collagen are clipped off, there's a C end and an N end, and the end of a peptide is called the telopeptide. peptide. And so the CTX is the C telopeptide fragment and the NTX, the N telopeptide fragment. So these are the two classical bone markers that I'll be mentioning in a few minutes. And then there's an enzyme also made by the osteoclast, uh, tartrate resistant acid phosphatase, type 5B. And this enzyme, we believe mainly reflects the number of osteoclasts rather than their activity. And for bone formation, uh, we're thinking now of the osteoblast, which is responsible for making matrix protein. And so osteocalcin is fairly unique to bone, so it's very specific. There are the propeptides of type 1 procollagen, and the one that's proven particularly useful uh, is P1NP, and the reason why it's more useful than the C-terminal one is the C-terminal one has its removal is hormonally regulated, and the, these hormones can go awry in various conditions such as diabetes, so it's not a very good marker. And then bone alkaline phosphatase, uh, is this, it's got the same, um, it comes from the same gene as liver alkaline phosphatase, but the post translational modifications are different, and so we can make use of that in our assays to try and measure the bone isoform. And the International Osteoporosis Foundation and IFCC, um, we had a committee that got together to propose which two markers, if you can only have two markers, which two would you always measure in your studies? And we said we felt that probably it should be CTX for resorption and P1MP for formation. So you may find that I tend to focus particularly on those two markers. Now, when we're making these measurements, we must remember that they are reflecting active processes which have dynamic rhythms. 
And so if we want to have data which we can interpret, we must allow for this. And so in allowing for this, there are some things that we can control. And so things like the circadian variation, so the bone turnover markers are the highest uh, overnight and first thing in the morning and lowest in the afternoon. So it's really important, that, especially for the bone resorption markers, that you measure them at a fixed time of day, usually first thing in the morning and fasting. Uh, if you if you have food intake, they usually decrease, so you need to allow for that. And then we have uncontrollable factors such as age and gender and menopausal status. And so we need to have reference intervals based on age, uh, men and women, and uh, whether the woman's are menopausal or not. And another really important source of uncontrollable variability is fracture. Um, a recent fracture, fracture within the past year, will cause an elevation in the bone turnover markers because it, the, the healing of the fracture uh, involves bone cells. So, and these bone markers have been used in a number of situations. So usually we're thinking about the postmenopausal woman. And in that situation, the higher the bone marker, the greater the rate of bone loss. The higher the bone marker, the greater the risk of fracturing. And the higher the marker, usually, the more likely they are to have secondary osteoporosis and respond well to anti-resorptive treatments. So they have proven useful, and they've proven particularly useful in monitoring the response to therapy. But today, I'm not talking about their clinical use, I'm talking about their use in understanding the pathophysiology of the bone disease of diabetes. So what do we know about that? So, in, so the, the Danish groups have had some uh, lovely uh, systematic reviews and meta-analyses about what's happening to bone turnover markers, and here's the one by Heigum, which is showing that this particular marker, P1MP, uh, is decreased by about 25% in patients with diabetes. And this is a fairly consistent finding, as you can see, but from all these individual studies. And so that's uh, consistent. CTX is also fairly consistently decreased by about 30%. So decreased formation, decreased resorption. Osteocalcin is also fairly consistently decreased as well. So, so these three markers are all showing very consistent changes. Type 5B, usually decreased, particularly in type 2 diabetes. But there are a couple of markers that don't show clear-cut changes. Uh, one of these is the bone isoform of alkaline phosphatase. And I mentioned to you that this is the same gene product as liver alkaline phosphatase. And the, the only difference is the post-translational modification. And as a result, there's quite a lot of overlap of liver alphos in the bone alphos assay, at least about 20%. And because type 2 diabetes often goes along with obesity, and obesity can often go along with fatty liver, the liver alphos can be increased. And it may be that this is masking any decrease in bone formation. There are other explanations, but that's my favorite explanation. And again, NTX creatinine is a resorption marker, so it ought to be decreased because it relies on renal function for its excretion. And of course, kidneys are often damaged in diabetes. This might be the reason that the handling of these crosslinks by the kidney could be altered in diabetes. So here's a, a typical study. Um, this is one from New York uh, showing what happens in type 2 diabetes. You can see quite clearly the P1MP is lower than in controls. Uh, bone arc is, uh, is slightly higher uh, for the reasons I just mentioned. Osteocalcin is lower. trap 5 b in this particular study wasn't different. And CTX was clearly lower. Now, the reason why I'm showing you this uh, table is that in the same study, they did bone biopsies. So the, the question is, is the decrease with the P1MP and CTX, is it reflected in the bone biopsy? And they did the bone biopsy with tetracycline doubling labeling, so therefore it was done correctly. And this shows what happens in the three different envelopes of the bone, the cancellus, the endocortical, and the intracortical bone. And the variable I always find most useful when I'm studying bone markers 
is the bone formation rate divided by the bone surface. Uh, this is thought to be the most appropriate comparator. And you can see for the type 2 diabetes, this is about one fifth of that in controls. So a very clear reduction in this, in this approach to measuring bone turnover on the bone biopsy. These are very much in keeping with what was happening to the CTX and the P1MP. And in fact, the bone markers might be underestimating the decrease that's truly seen in diabetes. So that was a really helpful a study confirming the big reduction in bone turnover in diabetes. So it's almost certainly true that patients with type 2 diabetes have got low turnover. So if, it, if that's the case, if there is a reduction in bone turnover, what are the consequences? So I want to spend a few minutes just going through these with you. And this is an area which um, I've only really started to understand in the last year or so. And so I hope you'll find the data I'm going to show you quite interesting. So this is one paper that I was involved with from Nicola Napoli. And this is from the Health ABC study. And I'll, I'll be showing you other data from Health ABC study because it's a very well characterized cohort of older women in their 70s. And so if you uh, start off at the top here, and let's look at the CTX, a bone marker of bone resorption, and look at the, the relationship to uh, all fractures. So this, this, this top line is the all, um, all clinical fractures. Now the, the darker circle represents women without diabetes. And so this is the classical appearance that in women without diabetes, the higher the CTX, the higher the risk of fracturing. And so here, this is a CTX increase of 20%. And so the consequence is a 10% increase in the risk of fracturing. And so that's typical of what we find in study after study, that bone resorption uh, is linked to higher fracture risk. The higher the bone resorption, the higher fracture risk. But then when we look at the gray circle, we find that this isn't true for diabetes. In fact, the opposite is true. And so the lower the CTX, the higher the fracture risk. So already we're seeing something quite unusual here. And this interaction was significant. It was P of 0.04. And so, so we found that a very interesting finding. It wasn't so clearly there for hip fracture or for spine fracture. But for forearm fracture, uh, it was even more striking. And so now, again, the, for the non-diabetic women, the higher the bone resorption marker, the higher the fracture risk, but for the diabetic women, the lower the CTX, the higher the risk of fracturing. So I was really surprised when I saw this data and it's intriguing. And of course it does, there is some supporting data from previous studies, but again, we probably need to have further data to be absolutely sure about this, but it's really pointing us towards this low bone turnover, quite possibly having a role in the increased fracture risk that goes along with diabetes. Now, as I was saying to you that in, we normally think about patients with type two diabetes having lower turnover. And in, in postmenopausal women, whenever we see lower turnover, we see lower bone loss rates. But in diabetes, the opposite is true. In, di in this study here, again, the health AB, uh, sorry, this is the, um, it's also from, from uh, Anne Schwartz's group, that uh, we see that the rate of bone loss uh, of the femoral neck is faster than it is in patients with not the diabetes. So they're starting off from a higher BMD, of course, because that's the, always the case in type 2 diabetes, that BMD is higher than normal. But the rate of bone loss is faster, and, so, and yet they have lower turnover. So that's really interesting, because it's quite uncommon to have low turnover as a major factor in uh, bone loss. The only co common situation I can think of where, that, where we find that is in glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis, where we have low bone, turn, low bone formation and high rates of bone loss. So, so it's a very interesting finding uh, that the low turnover is going along with higher rates of bone loss. And the study that we just published this year as well, uh, the first author was Serge Ferrari. Uh, in this study, we wanted to ask the question that if you have a, um, in women with osteoporosis and diabetes, did they have a different 
responds to denosumab therapy. So denosumab is our most po powerful anti-resorptive therapy for osteoporosis. And the FREEDOM trial is the biggest trial that we've uh, conducted with this drug. And we found a really interesting finding. And that was that, uh, not for vertebral fracture, vertebral fracture was prevented in, in diabetics just like it is in non-diabetics. But for non-vertebral fracture, there was actually an increase in non-vertebral fracture risk. And the fractures that were particularly predominant were radius and ribs. So that means the radius has come out both in the Napoli study and in the Ferrara study as, as being possibly associated with particularly low bone turnover. And so that's something definitely for further consideration. The rib fracture is also quite an interesting association too and should be borne in mind when we're carrying out our epidemiological studies. So the last thing I wanted to say about, uh, about this whole question about low turnover and fractures, then one of the ways in which a low turnover state might be more likely to cause uh, fractures is that one of the functions of remodeling is to remove micro cracks, and micro damage. And here uh, with this fusion red stain of cortical bone, we can see two cracks, two micro cracks. And the idea is that these micro cracks can propagate and cause a catastrophic stress fracture. And one of the types of catastrophic stress fractures that we've all paid particular attention to over the past uh, few years is the atypical femur fracture. So we think of this as being a stress fracture because it means just that the bone is like a stick of chalk and it just uh, cracks when it snaps. And we can see from these different pictures, uh, the, the two on the left and the middle are both femoral shaft fractures, and the one on the right is a subtrochanteric fracture. And we, we've come to associate these with the treatment with bisphosphonates particularly. There is an association with other treatments uh, like uh, denosumab, but, but it's particularly associated with bisphosphonate use. And I was intrigued by this uh, paper from Denmark that's just been published uh, by Rasmussen and colleagues, which has shown that in type one diabetes, there was an increase in femoral shaft and subtrochanteric fractures. So of course, this is all uh, femoral shaft and subtrochanteric, so they're willing, well, they will include atypical femur fractures, but other things too. But it does raise an interesting question that diabetes may well be contributing to these atypical femur fractures. And in some case series, when people have looked for risk factors for atypical femur fractures, type, uh, type two diabetes has, uh, has, show, has raised its head as being one of, the, one of the contributing factors. So it's also possible therefore that the changes in bone quality in diabetes are resulting in a greater risk of these atypical femur fractures. Okay, so much of the consequences then of the low turnover. What are the causes? So here I'm going to consider obesity. Uh, then I'm going to discuss the possibility of sclerosis mediating this. And finally, I'm going to discuss hyperglycemia. Uh, I could have considered other ones, but these are the ones I'm going to focus on today. because they're the ones that particularly uh, interest me. And so when we're thinking about obesity, there are a number of hormones that are changed in obesity compared to normal weight. So estradiol tends to be higher because the adipose tissue is the major source of the enzyme aromatase which is responsible for the production of estradiol, particularly in the older woman and in men. Uh, leptin is another important hormone that's increased in obesity, and it does have an anti-resorptive activity. And this also could be the mediator of the changes in bone turnover in obesity. And then I'll say a little bit about sclerostin and how this might also be mediating, of course, sclerostin is high in obesity and in diabetes, and I'll explain how this might also cause the low bone formation. And then hyperglycemia uh, has been shown in vitro and in uh, patients to be associated with increased, uh, with, with low bone turnover. And it's also a risk for causing the accumulation of ages, which I'll say more about. I could have talked about many other factors, and one of the areas that I'm particularly interested in and I'm working on as part of the Fidelio partnership is microRNA, but here we're in very early days, so I won't say very much about that today.
So let's just begin with obesity. So, so when I started working on diabetes, uh, type 2 by diabetes, I thought would just be like obesity. And so, that, and because I'd been doing research on obesity, then I thought this is going to be a piece of cake uh, studying type 2 diabetes. And so this is one of our publications on, on what happens to bone turnover in diabetes. Uh, sorry, in obesity, I'm sorry. In obesity, and we looked at uh, men and women, uh, young and old. And so if we start on the left, <clears throat> the panel there is CTX, a bone resorption marker. And so both in uh, these uh, uh, normal weight and obese women, we see the decrease in the young ones uh, with CTX. And in the men, men, younger men tend to have slightly higher bone turnover, but the obese men have lower bone turnover. So for young, for young ones, uh, bone resorption is lower if you're obese. And for older ones, uh, 55 to 75, again, women are lower, lower if you're obese and men lower if you're obese. And all those patterns are shown in the P1MP pretty much on the right. So it seems therefore, no matter what, what your age as an adult, and no matter what your gender, obesity goes along with low bone turnover. And when we've tried to find the uh, likely cause uh, in, in various regression models, certainly estradiol and leptin come out very strongly as, as uh, predictors of bone turnover. But although that might all be the case, I don't think it explains very much. Um, and the reason why I say that is in obesity, hip fractures are actually reduced not at all increased as they are with diabetes. So that tells you that these changes can't be the explanation. And also rates of bone loss are reduced in diabetes, not increased. So obesity is not such a good model. It might explain why obese diabetics tend to be more protected against fractures, but it, otherwise it doesn't really help us understand diabetic bone disease. So I'll move on from that one. So the next one that I thought I would consider is sclerostins. So sclerostins are proteins synthesized by the osteocyte uh, acting locally on the osteoblast precursor to inhibit bone formation. And so here we can see that whether it's type one diabetes or type two, there tends to be a higher levels of sclerostin. And sclerostin we think of as being a signal uh, which relates to the mechanical stress is going through the skeleton. So if somebody is inactive, they might have a high sclerostin. And it may well be that's the cause here, and it may not. But the point is that a high sclerostin might go along with a low bone formation. And uh, here's the correlation from a Chinese group suggesting that uh, this is indeed a, a negative relationship between sclerostin levels and osteocalcin levels. This is, this is in male diabetics. So what's the mechanism here? Well, this is a proposal from the Danish group and suggesting that the osteocyte uh, produces more sclerostin. This inhibits the osteoblast. Um, and then of course the osteoblast talks to the osteoclast. And in, in their model, they also found increased levels of OPG. So that would also inhibit the osteoclast. And so that you might expect low bone formation, low resorption from this double whammy of uh, decrease in sclerostin, sorry, an increase in sclerostin and an increase in osteoprotegium. So that's kind of like the model they propose. So it's, it's possible. The only reason why I'm a little bit cautious about uh, feeling wholehearted about this is that circulating sclerostin may not be the same as tissue sclerostin. Uh, sclerostin, as I was saying earlier, is produced by the osteocyte and acts in a paracrine measure, a paracrine fashion. So measuring it in the circulation it may not reflect those local levels. Um, the, next, the next topic is what about hyperglycemia? Uh, does hyperglycemia itself have effects on bone turnover? And so I'm showing you here the relationship between uh, random glucose levels and uh, the non-fasting glucose levels and the bone turnover markers. And you can see that they're all negative relationships with the four bone markers. And so and this is uh, found if you also, if you use hemoglobin A1C usually, but not always, this negative relationship. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, and it makes you kind of wonder whether this is glucose itself that could be causing the changes in bone turnover. 
And by the way, I'm just showing at the bottom right, there is some osteoprotegerin there in, uh, having a positive relationship, which was going along with that previous model. So if this effect occurs, is it direct or indirect? Well, the evidence for the direct comes from cell, uh, cell, cell studies, uh, uh, isolated osteoclasts. And so here, uh, osteoclasts stimulated by rank ligand were also incubated with either D-glucose, which is the normal glucose that's in our bodies, or L-glucose, which isn't usually found there. And you can see that it's only D-glucose that is actually inhibiting uh, osteoclast activity. And the pictures on the left show the osteoclasts being inhibited. And so these are very high levels of glucose, 25 millimoles, but even so, it is interesting that perhaps the glucose itself might have inhibitory effects on bone resorption. So the very last topic I want to mention to you uh, is the concept of ages. And uh, you might be wondering uh, why I'm talking about ages when uh, I'm really being focusing on bone turnover markers, but there may be a link. So, so what are ages? So these are the advanced glycation end products. And so basically they're when proteins and other, other molecules, when they react with glucose, uh, various changes can happen. And these are changes that occur over weeks and months and years. So they're slow uh, reactions and they don't involve enzymes, they're non-enzymatic changes. And you can see uh, that the glycation of these proteins, you can see how in the very top row there, that <clears throat> the glucose is reacting with the amino group of a protein. So a typical protein that's got an amino side chain would be lysine, for example. And so it's, we're having this uh, uh, reaction. And so one of the most important of the, of the ages, and I'll talk more about this in a moment, is referred to as CML. And the, the full name for CML is n carboxymethyl lysine. So you can see why I call it CML. And it's a bit of a mouthful. And so I'll be saying more about CML in a moment. And I also, just for the time being, I just want to point out that CML binds to a receptor, um, which is uh, the classical receptor is called RAGE. So the receptor for age. And uh, as a result of this interaction of CML with RAGE, we have a production of a number of cytokines, growth factors, and various other products. So this is, a, this is one of the mechanisms by which CML works. Uh, but the other type of uh, ages that can happen are cross-linking. So here we have cross-linking occurring between uh, one, coll one collagen molecule and an adjacent one. And so uh, this is all, all, all occurred as a result of this formation of pentosity. And so uh, this is another type of uh, cross-link, which I'll be talking about in a moment. So, so when we think about the way that ages happen, they probably, ages work, they probably work in different ways. So they work in relation to cross-linking, which could affect fibrosis, it could affect tissue stiffening, it might affect the bone quality. And the middle one has got the cellular activation of the age-rage signaling, showing the ages binding to the rage receptor and having uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines, apoptosis, reactive oxygen species, and so forth. These might well contribute to diabetic complications, and they might also uh, affect bone. And then there are also alterations in bone structure and function. So ages don't just work in one way, they work in several ways. And we can measure them. Uh, we can measure them in serum, in urine, in tissue, such as bone. Um, and we can measure them in skin. And we can uh, do those measurements by ELISA, uh, by uh, FBLC tandem mass spec, and by autofluorescence. Uh, over on the right here, uh, because skin contains ages, uh, you can actually get, this, get the ages to autofluoresce and measure that using this age reader. And so that's been done in a few studies in relation to diabetes and bone. And, and of course, if it fluoresces, it's probably going to be the pentosidine or something like it. So here, uh, just to show you the pentosidine uh, more clearly, uh, here we've got the type, type 1 collagen. Uh, here we've got pentosidine uh, joined up through this, uh, this cross-link here. 
and, uh, and as I say, it takes probably takes years for it to form uh, these uh, pentosidine, and the, the greater the ambient glucose, the more pentosidine we expect. So people have already shown higher pentosidine levels in patients with type 2 diabetes. So does it relate to anything else? So in this study here from Anne Schwartz, uh, then she showed that in diabetics, then fractures are more common in patients with the higher levels of um, uh, pentosidine. And um, this is true for clinical fractures. It wasn't true for um, vertebral deformities so much, uh, just borderline. And also it related to the rate of bone loss. So the, the faster bone loss, people with mitral cancer, was seen in patients with higher uh, pentosity. So that's kind of like interesting that there is a link between ages and bone loss and, uh, and fracture risk. Um, and this idea that the, that the ages might also be working through altering bone turnover. Uh, he, here's a, a recent review about uh, how uh, ages might relate to bone. And so they, the authors were proposing that the, uh, the hyperglycemia results in age accumulation. Um, the age accumulation then uh, binds to the rage receptor and has a number of uh, effects, some of which are pro-inflammatory. And that in the long term, these might decrease the uh, proliferation and uh, formation of osteoblasts. And in this model, they increase osteoclasts in this model. But in prior data, uh, they've been shown that actually the more ages, the less there's osteoplastic bone resorption. And so it is possible that ages are mediating some of these effects uh, that we've observed already on bone turnover to decrease uh, resorption formation. But this is something which requires further exploration. So, uh, the very last thing I want to show you is a, a, an abstract that was presented at the ASBMR uh, relating CML to fracture risk in the health ABC. And so, uh, so they measured the CML using an ELISA. Uh, they uh, found that uh, for, every, uh, in, uh, for every SD increase in uh, CML in the serum, uh, there was a 1.4 factor uh, association with fracture risk. And it was also associated with prevalent fractures. So this is just showing you which, which mark, which, where CML is. I've already shown you where CML is. So, uh, uh, so you can see it here as well. This, here's the lysine with the, uh, with, the, with the side chain. CML is what they're measuring. And they found that there was also, and this is a table that just shows the association with clinical fracture and borderline for vertebral fracture. And so this is intriguing as well. So not only is pentosidine being associated with fractures, but so too is CML. So that's kind of like intriguing because it's working through a different pathway. So to finish up, I've tried to show you that diabetes is associated with increased fracture risk and that this is best explained by changes in bone quality. That bone turnover is decreased in diabetes, both type 1 and type 2. It seems that in type 2 diabetes that low turnover is associated with increased bone loss and possibly fractures. And I even, even uh, uh, they made a speculation it might relate to atypical femur fractures. And the causes of bone turnover, it could be related to various local factors such as sclerostin and ages. So I'll stop, I'll stop there and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. <laughs>